All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice exam series. We're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. A doctor designed a medication program for patients with chronic illnesses, focusing on improving their ability to take medication on time. The goal is to enhance their overall health by ensuring they consistently follow their prescribed treatment. Which dimension of behavior analysis is represented by focusing on this outcome? So we have a dimension question, and just like our assumption questions, we want to be very precise and use the information given to us. Follow where the question is taking you. So we are looking at the dimension that is focused on the outcome. Now, when we focus on outcomes, we want them to be socially valid and meaningful. The goal of this doctor and his medication program is to enhance overall health by ensuring they follow their treatment. So he wants to enhance the overall health of his patients. He's looking for meaningful change. What dimension is related to that? Well, that's going to be applied. We choose applied goals so we can make meaningful changes in our client's life. Conceptually systematic, it's unclear if the doctor is using ABA terminologies and interventions. Technological, we aren't discussing whether or not this is a repeatable program, just whether if it's meaningful and socially valid and applied. And then generality, it doesn't appear that we are focused on generalization here. The main focus here is the overall health of these patients, therefore the dimension is applied. Max, a clinical director, is in desperate need of another supervisor who can write treatment plans and train technicians. He knows that one of the current behavior technicians is taking their board certification exam in two days and he is confident they will pass, so he decides that he will let that technician start doing supervisor work now. Is there anything wrong with this? Whenever you're reading ethical questions, and this is an ethical slash supervision management question, there are things that should start to jump out of you if you are reading critically. As soon as you read that a current technician is taking their exam in two days, but the supervisor lets them start doing supervisor work now, immediately you should be thinking, well, that's not okay because one, the technician is not qualified. Even if they're competent, they're practicing outside their scope. So they're violating several different rules of our task list and ethical code. So is there anything wrong with this? A, yes, the technician should only practice within their, within their qualifications. Absolutely. The technician, no matter how good they are, has not passed their board exam. They cannot do this supervisory work and treat and write treatment plans and train technicians. B, yes, you should wait six months after your board's exam to write treatment plans. No, as soon as they pass, they can start writing these treatment plans and helping train technicians. But not until then can they do this supervisor work. C, no, as long as Mac knows that Max knows the technician is competent. Maybe they are, right? But they're not a supervisor yet. They can't supervise these technicians without their board certification. Uh, being passed. D, no, the board certification exam is just a formality. It is a very serious certification, right? It says you have met the qualifications to perform these supervisory works. So is there anything wrong with this? Yes, the technician should only practice within their qualifications. It is clear to Mr. Bob that one of his drummers in his band did not practice over the weekend. After the drummer made their third mistake in a row, Mr. Bob tells the drummer to make the same mistake 10 more times as the rest of the band sits and watches. What is Mr. Bob using? This is a question that as you get better and become more fluent, you're going to be able to answer extremely quickly. And on your exam, there will be questions that are quite easy. We don't want to overthink them. Trust your prep. Move on. In this case, Mr. Bob knows one of his drummers did not practice. What does he do? Well, after the third mistake in a row, Mr. Bob tells the drummer, make that same mistake 10 more times. What intervention do we require the learner or the person to make the same mistake over and over again? A, positive practice over correction. With positive practice, we are engaging in the correct response over and over again. With mass practice, 
This has to do with a self-management technique. It's related to this, but this isn't self-management. So instead of mass practice, we're looking for negative practice overcorrection. And then, of course, restitution overcorrection has to do with repairing the environment to a better state than before. Again, when you get better at the exam and more fluent, this becomes a super simple question. A high school teacher wants a measurement system that will allow them to collect data without constantly needing to observe the student or students of interest. Which of the following systems would not meet this requirement? Most important word in this question is not. We're looking for a system that will not meet the requirement. And what is the requirement? Well, the teacher wants to collect data without, observe, without constantly needing to observe. How can we do that? What are some ways we can take data without observation? Well, we can use things like permanent product and momentary time sampling. What systems are not going to meet that requirement? Well, if you look at A, partial interval recording, that is not going to meet the requirement because with partial interval recording, you still need to constantly observe the student of interest. Play check is just a form of momentary time sampling, which allows you to not have to observe everybody all the time. Time sampling, of course, you only have to observe at the end of the interval, momentary time sampling, for example. And then permanent product recording is measuring the product, not the behavior itself. Jim wants to improve his behavior in meetings with his employees. He hires two consultants to observe him during meetings. The consultants are both tracking criticisms, affirmations, and negative comments made by Jim. Initially, the two consultants tracking these behaviors will most improve what aspect of data collection. When we think about data, we think about accuracy, validity, and reliability. But this fourth idea of believability is also something to consider. For example, we have two consultants tracking the same things, criticisms, affirmations, negative comments. Now, we have no idea if they're accurate, if they're valid, if they're reliable, but we do know two people are tracking the same thing. So if we have two or more people tracking the same thing, that at the very least will improve what? Well, believability. Inter-observer agreement improves believability. Now, what would accuracy be? Well, let's say for criticisms, there are three criticisms. Accurate data would have three criticisms. They would record exactly what happened. Valid data would track the right behavior. So they would track criticisms. And then reliable data would be able to track the same thing over and over again. So each time it happens, we would get accurate data and hopefully track the right thing. In this case though, it's just inter-observer agreement and it's only, and it's really going to improve believability. Analyze the following graph. Which condition features both verification and prediction? All right, baseline logic. Verification, replication, and prediction. Now, when we are predicting, where does that begin? That's going to begin in treatment one. This right here is our first prediction. This is our prediction of what baseline would look like if intervention never begins. Then we have another prediction up here and a third prediction here. What does it look like if we don't change? Verification verifies those predictions. So if we go from baseline to treatment one, we've predicted that. If we go back to baseline, what have we done? We have verified our prediction. And we've also predicted what treatment one would do had we continued as well. Now, what do we call this if we if we reintroduce treatment? Well, that is what we call replication. Okay, so replication has occurred here. Verification and prediction have occurred in baseline two. We verified our baseline and predicted what would happen with the intervention. Following a paired choice preference assessment and a reinforcer assessment, Lou has identified two possible reinforcers for his client. Lou's client receives 40 hours of service a week because of their age and developmental level. What possible issues may arise for Lou given this information? Okay, so what issues are going to arise for Lou? Well, what information do we know? We know he's done his preference and reinforcer assessments, and he's identified two possible reinforcers. Now, two isn't a whole lot, especially 40 hours a week. What's the first thing you can 
think of when you when you think we have two reinforcers for 40 hours of service? What do you think is going to happen to those reinforcers? Well, I would think the client's going to get tired of them. So let's look at A. Lou, Lou has chosen too many reinforcers and won't know which one is effective. Two is not a lot. We need more than that, especially for this level of service. B, Lou failed to do a punishment assessment to balance out the reinforcer assessment. That is not a thing, right? That's not accurate. C, Lou's client may experience satiation of the reinforcers. Yes, Lou's client may just get tired of the same two things over 40 hours. Lou needs to find more if he can. Lou's client, client may experience deprivation. Well, deprivation is the opposite of satiation. Deprivation is when you don't have enough. In this case, we've got too much. Lose client has too has gotten too much of this reinforcement. So lose client may experience satiation of their reinforcers. An 11 year old boy in a school for children with behavioral problems is doing well. As a reward, he will get to spend the weekend with his family, but only if he does not engage in aggression for the next two days. The following day, the boy, as a joke, hits his friend with a paper airplane. The teacher, who was not given a clear definition of aggression, takes away the boy's weakened privileges. What dimension was failed most here? If you're wondering why our dimensions are so important, this is a good example, right? And here you've got a 11-year-old at a school for behavior problems, and he's been doing great, and he gets to spend the weekend with his family, but he can't be aggressive. The problem is he throws a paper airplane, and since there's not a definition, his privileges are taken away. Now, what did we forget to do? We did not define aggression well. And that is unfair to this boy. He has now been punished for something he didn't do wrong. So if we have failed to give a clear definition, what dimension have we failed? A, conceptually systematic. Conceptually systematic is more related to our ABA technologies and ideas. Defining behavior isn't necessarily ABA conceptually systematic. It's just something that should be done whenever handling behaviors. Behavioral is much more along the lines. If we're going to target a behavior, we have to define it. We have to be able to observe it. We have to be able to measure it reliably. Applied. Well, we're talking about the lack of definition here. And that's the problem in this situation. Same as effective. We're not talking about the effectiveness of an intervention. We're, we're talking about the failure of being behavioral by not defining aggression clearly. A restaurant owner wants to encourage customers to recycle after finishing their meals. To achieve this, they place large colorful signs above the recycling bins with pictures showing which items belong in each bin. Over time, more customers begin using the recycling bins correctly. What strategy is the restaurant owner using to guide customer behavior? Okay, pretty easy prompting question, right? We have a situation where we want customers to recycle. So we have recycling bins. And then over the bins, what do we have? Some sign that has the recycling symbol on it. Now, the, the recycling bin should be enough, but we've added a prompt because it isn't enough. And it's being, and it's effective. The customers begin using the cycling bins correctly. So this is what? What type of, type of prompt is this? Is it positional, visual, is it modeling, or is it positive reinforcement? Well, it's not reinforcement. It's an antecedent to throwing away the item. So don't be confused that the behavior is increased. It isn't modeling because the sign is obviously not modeling what to do. It's a visual prompt, right? We put a visual prompt over the correct bin, which is leading to the correct behavior. Before asking his child to clean up the entire living room, a father first asks the child to complete smaller tasks, such as picking up a few toys and placing a pillow back on the couch. After successfully completing these smaller tasks, the child is more likely to clean up the rest of the room without resistance. What behavioral strategy is being used to increase the likelihood of compliance with the larger task? All right, another example of a question that once your fluency is up and you've been practicing, you're going to answer very quickly. What strategy is being used? Well, as soon as you start to see this father wants the child to clean the entire living room, but first he asks for smaller tasks to be done, immediately we should be thinking high probability request sequence, right? Pick up toys, place pillow back on couch, clean up rest of room. What has the father done? A, behavior progression. Behavior progression is not necessarily a term we're going to use here. We're going to use behavior 
momentum. It's not a task analysis. The father hasn't broken down any skills into some sort of chain. And it isn't behavior chaining. The father's not teaching the child anything. He's building up behavior momentum in order to evoke the more difficult or less preferred or less likely problem behavior or not problem behavior, just behavior in general. So what strategy is used? Behavior momentum. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe on YouTube. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.